Order, order, this Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, and this is our second panel today in our inquiry into the economics of music streaming. We're joined by uh, Fiona Bevin, songwriter and singer, uh, Sweater Kinch, a jazz saxophonist, MC and composer, and Niall Rogers, a songwriter, producer and artist. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, uh, and thank you as well, Niall, as I understand you're in the United States as well, so thank you for that. Um, just one bit of housekeeping, if I may. Could the witnesses, could you place yourselves on mute until you're called to answer? There, there's, no inter there's no sound interference, and if that's okay. Thank you very much. Our first question is going to come from Steve Bryan. Steve Bryan. Steve Bryan. Hello. Hello, yes. Could you, you're, you're called to question. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't... Um wasn't, un wasn't unmuting my end. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I don't know whether you've had a chance to listen to the evidence that has been given so far, uh, either be before or in today's session, but um, last week we had um, recording artists, Sonny John Ray, forming from Gomez, and Ed, Ed O'Brien from Radiohead, uh, and others talking to us thank about what they first believe. From Steve Bryan. Steve Bryan. Right, OK. Uh, what, what they believe is very little transparency in the process. I just wonder, um, let, let's start with you, Fiona. Hi. Um, whether you believe that, that that's something you'd agree with, um, both as artists, both as songwriters, whether that this is a, a process that is cloaked in mystery. Yes, I would have to agree that the lack of transparency is a really, really big problem. Um, I'm an independent artist as well as a songwriter for other artists. And so we've talked quite a lot on these sessions so far about artists and performers. So my big focus today is to talk about songwriters. Mm. Um, but I can speak from both points of view. Mm. But yes, the lack of transparency, any any songwriter will know that when they get their PRS statement and see the streaming income, it's all 0.0003 for this, 0.0005 for that. And in different countries, it's different amounts. We don't know the rates for each country because of the NDAs between the streaming platforms and the publishers and labels. And so, yeah, it's basically unauditable um, and it's, it's kind of incalculable because these tiny, tiny sums, well, I mean, you've probably seen some of the stats, but one of the stats that the Ivers have just published is that eight out of 10 songwriters earn less than 200 pounds a year from streaming. So we have a big problem here and people don't know why they're getting so little. Yeah. They don't know where it's coming from. There are many bodies taking a little cut along the way. If you look at dissecting the digital pound. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpick there. Mm. Okay, so then just as initial thoughts, Sueto, what, you, what are your thoughts? You're nodding, uh, nodding there during that answer from Fiona. Transparency. You need to unmute and, uh, yeah. if, you, if, you and if you and Mr. Rogers unmute, then you'll be ready to arrive. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there was some confusion in the first session as to whether this lack of transparency is by default or by design. Well, it's definitely by design. And it's something that I've seen throughout my career as a self-releasing artist, an independent song, songwriter, jazz musician as well. Uh, there are people with vested interests in keeping that system as opaque and un, sort of unintelligible as possible, because if you don't know what to ask for, then you don't know how much you're entitled to. And that goes, that went back to the days when I wanted to put out a record myself and people say, oh, AP2 licenses and barcodes as if it was really complex stuff when actually it was just a couple of phone calls and emails away. I think there are still people with a vested interest in making you get the impression this is all really difficult to sort out and it's all so polarised and dissipated that you'll never be able to collect all this revenue. Well, actually, it's never been easier to collect metadata. You don't have to go around to every pub that your song is played in. You can, there is a digital trail for all of this music as it's being played on all these different platforms. So, um, yeah, I think we shouldn't have much time for these, these agencies sort of pleading poverty or that it's really difficult in this time of COVID. Because one of the most egregious things is that my journey has involved going from being an artist with an independent label who could be guaranteed some royalties to relying 
pretty heavily on live gigs, live engagements, and selling my own merchandise, my self-released merchandise on my sets. With the complete dissipation, the evisceration of all my live gigs this year, that's no longer a possibility. Record labels have been trying to encroach on that live merch world for a while now with 360 deals, etc. And it just seems really pernicious to be complaining that it's more difficult for them when as artists, we can't earn anything from live. Um, as Fiona quite eloquently put out that stat that the MU and others have mentioned today, that eight out of 10 musicians earn less than 200 pounds. Well, when apparently, I think the top three labels have generated 4.2 billion pounds this year, in the year of COVID, it just looks purely like market failure. It shouldn't be any other discussion other than how can that be right? And what sort of detrimental effect is that going to have on music creators? Not just me personally and how I interface with it, but sort of what music from Britain sounds like. We'd never have a Kate Bush or a David Bowie in today's music ecology because there's this very risk averse and there aren't people making those sorts of investments. And for an independently minded artist like that, you're making songs for playlists. You're making songs for a very narrow sonic wall. You're not making the sort of incredible musical risks that Bowie or somebody like Rod Stewart might have taken decades ago. So sorry mm. for my rant, but hold no, no, that, that all in for an hour and a half. I have, I have a feeling that a number of things you just said will be making it into our final um, report. And there's some brilliant, brilliant comments in there about market failure in particular. Um, and then, Mr. Rogers, pleasure to meet you. Um, Tell us your thoughts on non-disclosure agreements in the industry, your experience of them, and and this whole issue of transparency, and whether 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 you feel, without putting words in your head, that that it is presented as all being very complicated, and not something that artists need to worry their heads about. When actually, as Soweto says, it's not really that complicated at all. No, um, I just want to simply say I've been doing this. Um, God, I started with Sesame Street 1970 or 71. I've been doing this all my life. And I look at the record labels as my partners. And the interesting thing about my partners <laughs> is that every time I have audited my partners, every single time I find money, every time. Um, Every, you, you know, so the thing is, is that we must, we absolutely must have transparency. What, th there's no, I, I mean, there should be a wonderful relationship between both parties. I mean, partners are happy when both parties are happy. And the only time that we really get to check to see if things are the way they should be is we go in and audit. And every single time, and I am not making this up for dramatic purposes or comedic purposes, but every single time I have audited a label, I have found money. And sometimes it's staggering the amount of money. And that's because of the way that the system was designed right from the beginning. Um, with the way the system's set up now with, with all of these relationships between the labels under NDA and now we can no longer see. We don't even know what a stream is worth. I mean, does anyone, and I and I look at a very learned group of people here, does anyone, can anyone actually really tell me what a stream is actually worth? Yeah, you can. <laughs> and there's no way you can even find it. Uh, you, there's no way you can find out what a stream is worth. And th that's not a good partnership. I don't look at my record label partners as enemies. I look at them as my friends. I go to dinner with them. I, you know, when I'm in the south of France and I see Lucian, we're the happiest people in the world. But at the same time, uh, you, you know, COVID has given me a real opportunity to drill down on my numbers. And I am completely shocked. I love what the gentleman said, you know, I never thought about it that much because my touring revenue has been so substantial. I could support my entire organization. When when we were on tour with Cher and we were going into lockdown, I gave all my band members and all my crew a big advance. I had no idea what was going to happen. And only a few weeks ago, I did the same thing. Um, and that's because I'm in partnership with 
record companies for the rest of my life. So I do have a revenue stream that's coming in. But now that streaming has become the default mechanism uh, when it comes to, distri to distribution, and we know it's a great one, so it's never going to go backwards. Now is the perfect time to fix this stuff. Um, and, and let me just say very simply, because I don't want to rant. I, I have a, a real problem with talking way too much. But I just want to say something. And this is just very sober from my heart. Um, right now, we see with the companies um, exponential growth. We see their numbers going up and up and up. Why? Because streaming is an incredibly effective way to distribute the product. As we have all learned in math class, this is simple, basic stuff. When you have continued exponential growth, mathematically, what's the next thing that happens? Explosive growth, right? You have explosive growth. That's what's on the horizon. Why not fix these problems now? Because they know that what's coming is explosive growth for the labels. They are going to make more. If you think they're making a lot of money now, what do you think they're going to make in four years? Mm. It's going to be astronomical. So, so now you, is the time. Make your partners happy. Like, let's go into a room, have an organization that represents songwriters and artists at the table and say, look, we love you guys. We're in business together for the rest of our lives. Let's make it right. Let's make it fair now because your stockholders, your shareholders are going to be thrilled because you're getting ready to experience explosive growth in the next few years. Let's pay these people what they should have been making all along, and we're going to be one big happy family. Bingo and done. Mm. Well, you're famously a very hopeful and positive person. Uh, which is which is great to hear. But how much hope do you have that that will happen? Because, I mean, we are the Culture, Media and Sport Committee of, of the UK Parliament. And obviously, we, we, we look a lot at football. Football is a is a massive business. Um, and, and, you know, the Premier League here in England is huge with huge revenues. The talent in that context is the footballers. The footballers are incredibly well remunerated. Um, there is no market failure as far as they are concerned. I'm sure, I'm sure some would like more, but there's no market failure as far as they are concerned. They share in the, the bounty. Um, how, how hopeful are you, Niall, that, that, that the vision that you outline will actually happen without, cha without change in, in, in statute, which is what we are obviously capable of proposing? I, I, I'm extraordinarily hopeful because I think it makes sense the, the, the difference is, is that when you're talking about sport, the, the player is played for what they're doing at that moment. With music and IP, what we get paid for is the thing that we do at that moment, but the fact that it's consumed well after we've done it. <laughs> so, um, you, you know, when I was a kid and I studied music and I looked at my old heroes, you know, the ones that did well, who were the ones who got a job uh, working for the church or working for a lord or working at court or, or you know, things like that. So we, we knew as musicians, we were going to grow up pretty much being poor. Well, the thing that changed that paradigm was recorded music, was music that could actually be played while I'm not standing in that place, right? I mean, in other words, like, I don't have to be standing where the where my music is being consumed so we came up with an a, a mechanism to remunerate me for not having to be in that place but you still getting to enjoy what i what i do you get to enjoy my work that system has always been cloudy at best but now we have a chance a great opportunity because we know we absolutely know, we all learn this in math school. We all learn this. We all learn that if you're in the knee of some, if you're in the knee of a technological curve and you have, and you're experiencing exponential growth, then the thing that follows exponential is explosive. That means it's going to go wham, way up. We are not going to go backwards. We watched this happen when CDs were introduced into the marketplace. We went from analog to digital. 
once we entered this digital world and we could replicate something over and over and over and over again and the quality stayed the same, oh my God, that was a huge, huge revolution. We're never going backwards. It's always going to get nothing but better. Thank there... you. And, and just, 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 just finally then, and it's interesting you, you talk about you know, future-proofing, if you like. This is a moment to future-proof because, yes, you're right. The, the artistry that, that, you, that you guys put in is around for, for a long time after you have created it, unlike a, unlike a sports professional. Um, and, and that is only going to change as tech technology change isn't it because perform performances and maybe covid will be the instigator of this performances will be on recorded tape but who, who knows what technology will bring who knows what avatars will of you nile will appear at glastonbury in the future um doing doing your craft um and uh, there's a thought and, and yeah how will you uh, or your estate god forbid one day be paid for that you are you you've just explained it perfectly it, as as the technology changes and say for example that scenario you just described is the future that ip should have a way of being uh we should have a way of calculating it we should have a way of of understanding how the industry sets a price. And the best way that we would have an understanding is if we're sitting at the table, mm. right? We, we need to represent ourselves. We need to have someone sitting there representing us. And you, you, I think we all know the reason why that hasn't happened because it's a bit of a conundrum. The, the, the labels which own the recorded music, it's hard for them to fight for the people who've made the recorded music because it seems like you're fighting against yourself, but it's not really true. We are partners. And if you just sort of look at us as family, as you, you know, it, it's artists are really at a disadvantage. And I'm just going to go off topic just for a moment. We're really at a disadvantage because all my life I've seen when you know Mick Jagger walks in the room, or David Bowie walks in the room, or Diana Ross walks in the room, or Madonna, and we see the executives, we see the CEOs, it's a big smile on our face because we look at them. It's like they're the people who are looking out for us. They're the people that are our partners. They're taking care of us because artists intrinsically believe. I you know not not everyone, so don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to speak in absolute terms, but we intrinsically believe that we are in a good business. We're in a business of giving love and sharing art, and we believe that these people are in that business because they love the music and they love the people who make the music. If somehow they could just sort of turn around and see it from our side, and if they can't, let us have the power to have representation that can show them our side, that can speak for our side. Um, and I think that things would be very, very different very quickly. And the outcome and the, the growth and the finances that everyone would make would be fine. Everybody would be happy. You don't have to have somebody way up here and we're way down here. That's just ridiculous. Why can't we come like this? And there's, they're still going to make a hell of a lot more than we make. But still, if you can bring it a little bit more into balance, it would make a lot more sense and we'd be a lot happier. And why should we have to suffer the way we're suffering now? Half of my revenue is just out the window right now because of COVID. Nothing I can do about it. I'm not blaming anyone for that. But right now, if we had a better system, and we had transparency. As I said, not one person could tell me what a stream is worth. Not one. Th th thank you, Niles. Uh, just, no, just, I'm just going to just say at this point, we, we have about an hour left of the session, so I'm going to ask for just a, bit, uh, just a tiny bit of brevity just in terms of answers and response, if that's OK. Uh, Steve, have you finished your questions? Will you do anything else? Yeah, I just wonder whether Soweto wanted to add something to that. Yeah. He, he, he was itching in his seat there. I, I can <laughs> um, but, but other than that, back Please, to Soweto. Yeah. You're, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to um, expound on what you've eloquently described there now, if we are in a relationship with labels, though, often that relationship is abusive. And I can't 
underline enough how iniquitous the pro rata settlement that we have at the moment with songs are. That means the top 10 streaming artists get all of the miscellaneous revenue. In short, it produces ridiculous stats like 80% of subscribers on a platform like Deezer, their money goes to artists they've never listened to. Their subscriptions go to artists they've never listened to. Or a situation in which, as I said, if I create my Magnus Opus and thousands of people listen to it, not making it personal, but Dua Lipa, Ed Sheeran, the top 10 streaming artists get all of that money. Now, as again, as Nile said, you know, in a year that we're normally touring and got live revenues and t-shirt sales, you might not notice that. But in a year when all of that's dried up, how can it be right that we have a pro rata rather than a user, they call it a user-based agreement in which people could feel like they are supporting their artists more directly? And specifically with my genre, jazz music, um, three to six percent of its value is suppressed by this current model. If it was a user-based system, then alternative genres. And I can't underline how important these genres are. I was lucky to hear Mr. Rogers speaking about his own musical journey and loving bebop at a certain time. You know, I've stayed in that zone as a jazz musician, but we wouldn't have the funk, the hip hop, the other genres that without musicians taking a left turn sometimes, without getting into avant-garde things that aren't just profitable in the short term but work on their chops and develop a different musical ear. That, as I mentioned before, produces a, a Kate Bush or Rod Stewart, things that we can be proud of as a country. If that's not happening, then we're not gonna hear those voices in the future. It's all gonna sound very myopic, very narrow and very similar. Okay, thank you. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you to our three witnesses for the music and uh, the great pleasure you've brought to all of us uh, over the years. Um, Fiona, if I, it's nice to see you again. If I could start with you. Um, we, we've obviously heard in evidence about the split, the streaming revenue, you know, 55% goes to the recording side, 15% to the song. Um, why do you think that is? Well, it comes from an archaic split where the labels had huge physical overheads to produce vinyl and CDs, to store them and ship them. And, and we've heard about breakage as well during these sessions. Of course, very few people buy physical nowadays and streaming has taken over utterly. Mm. Um, and it's, and streaming, streaming has even supplanted downloads. So there's not really an excuse for these huge behemoth companies to have 55% when they don't have these physical overheads anymore. It's yeah, very, yeah. very cheap for them to distribute the music. So 15% is still going yeah. to the publishing. 15% is what the song itself gets. And 55% mm. is the record, the recording. Mm. And that, to me, is at the very, very fundamental basis of the problem. Because okay. if that was I, a bit more even, yeah. songwriters would actually be able to survive Mm. Right now, they're driving Ubers. Hit songwriters are driving Ubers. I was going to uh, sort of answer my next question in a way. I was going to ask you, and I hesitate to ask you this question because you're not an up-and-coming songwriter. You're obviously a very well-established songwriter who's had very big hits. But um, what is the impact of that on people coming into the industry as songwriters, do you think? Well, yeah, it's absolutely devastating. You know, I'm a guest lecturer quite often at universities. All these brilliant young students who are on commercial songwriting courses, popular music courses. They're all emerging from university with maybe 50,000 pound debt into this landscape, which has been utterly decimated. And it's very difficult for me to say to them, yes, songwriting is a great career to go into. Because as I said, eight out of 10 songwriters earn less than 200 pounds a year. Mm. And, you know, I had a track on an album that was number one very recently, number one in the album charts in the UK. That track, and that was the fastest selling solo artist album of the year at the time of release. And that track has earned me about £100. Mm. And, and what, what, what was your share of the song in that, um, Fiona? Are you able to tell us? Or? It was about 45, 48%. Right, okay. So basically almost a 50 50. Yeah. yeah. So basically the song had earned £200 effectively for songwriters. Yeah, so songwriters are these invisible people behind the scenes who are actually writing the songs. I mean, often it's the artist as well, but if you look at the charts, the vast majority of music in the charts is written through collaborations and teams. Mm. 
songwriters and producers and artists together, or producers and songwriters together. And, um, you know, these are the most successful songs in the country and in the world. Yeah. So we've had a lot of talk from independent musicians on the last session. But these, but pop songwriters, the most successful songwriters in the world, can't pay their rent. So there, okay. that's the that's the depth of the problem. Uh, thank you, thank you, Fiona. Soweto, um, it's interesting, this, isn't it? Because uh, actually, the publishing, uh, music publishing industry, is dominated these days by the same corporations that dominate the record industry. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but. Uh, <laughs> But why uh, do you think that it's turned out that um, they haven't been as forceful in pushing the interests for a share for their publishing arms as they have been for the uh, for the record? Well, they are behaving slightly like cartels, really, and the numbers of the ways in which their interests overlap and interleave are quite shocking once you discover them as an artist on the outside. The model for a jazz composer is actually quite interesting, and if you're independent, you'd be looking to pay splits to a composer, a band arranger, songwriters, lyric writers, etc. And it's, as Fiona implies, quite a team of people. And I guess the labels have a vested interest in diminishing that share so they don't have to pay arrangers, composers, etc. And you could, I suspect, in the olden days, have a sustained career from being an arranger, from being a composer. Um, when I myself do lectures and, and teach university undergrads to say, look, we need people in PR, we need people to organize, to curate shows and to arrange and compose. But if all of the income is either coming to the star performer or the back end in the label, then it doesn't make the idea of being a, an arranger professionally or a composer particularly viable. OK. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Soweto. And um, you know, I think it also in the in the origin of all of this, the, 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 the I think the record companies also had a stake in the in the streaming services themselves as well, probably, which is a reason why it might have been set up that way. Um, yeah. If I could come to, um, to 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 Niall, if um, is he still with us? Are you still there, Niall? I think you've lost. Am. Oh, you are good. Right, I okay, lost you there for a second. Sorry, sorry, Niall. Thank you, by the way. It must be very early in the morning where you are, but so thank you for joining us. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I, I've read your um, autobiography a couple of years ago, and it's an incredible. You've had an incredible life, and it's an extraordinary story. What what's sort of motivated you to really want to speak out on this issue today? So I feel that the UK is one of the most important um, musical. Um, engines in the world. I mean, you know, you've read my book, so you know the first song I ever learned to play was Beatles' the Day in the Life. And I now am uh, Chief Creative Advisor at Abbey Road Studios. So I am very, very fond of the UK. Also, it's given me a second career. I, um, you know... Um, Ireland put sheep back on the map, you mm. know, 15, 20 years ago, and it's been incredible ever since. But but I, I would just like to say something, because you're right, it's really early in the morning for me, and if you know anything about musicians, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get up at 5 a.m., which was only about an hour after I... You've yeah, been uh, up all night, tell us the truth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have, I, honestly. But I wrote this down before I fell asleep, because I thought that this was really important, and I wanted my words to be sober and clear and not hostile so you understand where we're coming from this just hit me last night a music stream should be treated as a license not a sale think about that this is really really important a license gives the artist 50 percent of the royalties for a song whereas a sale gives the artist between 15, I mean, between 18 and 30%. So since streaming became the main mechanism for consuming music, record companies have, an unil have, have unilaterally decided that a stream is considered a sale because it maximizes their profits. Mm. Duh, this hit me right before I fell asleep. And okay. it made all the sense in the world. Uh, in the old days, we would buy 
a CD and that was a sale. That was something we owned. Right. And, and there's a big difference or like those bicycles that are on the street that you can just put your credit card in and ride on the bicycle, but you have to return it. It's not your bicycle to keep forever. Um, anyway, sorry, I don't want to go off topic. OK, uh, okay. Let, let me just please this. Let me finish. Um, sure, of course. Artists and songwriters need to update clauses in their contracts to reflect the true nature of how their songs are being consumed which is via a license. They're not being consumed via a sale. It's consumed being a license, something that people are borrowing from. But we're, meanwhile, we're getting the remuneration doesn't doesn't correspond to the action. OK. You know? Th th thanks, Niall. I'm glad you, you were able to put that um, on the record for the for the uh, committee. Can I just ask you just one last question? I don't want to hog the time and others um, want to, to get in. There's been a, a, a whole sequence of interesting developments recently with very well-established songwriters um, selling off the, the right to the future income of their of their catalogs, including the news that Bob Dylan's just done it, I think, um, this mm -hmm. week, um, selling his for $300 million reportedly. And also, you know, obviously, there have been others recently. And you've been involved in, in, in working uh, it, it, with a, a, a company that is sort of acquiring those sorts of song rights and future streams of income but what do you think is happening there is there is there a development going on that committee should be aware of of why this is happening in this way at this time yeah i think that for the first time artists are starting to realize that their songs need to be managed just as their performances have been managed just like the the other aspects of their careers have been managed and what we're doing, I don't know what Universal is doing, I can't speak for them, but what we're doing at Hypnosis is we're managing the songs. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the artist songs perform at the peak of their... It, it, we want to make sure that, that artists are really being uh, taken care of. Artists and songwriters are not fairly remunerated for their streams. The streams, like it's as much as I love the the convenience. The the, the fact is, is the system. The the system. I tell you, it's six in the morning for me. The <laughs> system is is unfair. We need to have tra transparency, and if you can help us make this happen, things would change. And I guarantee you. Two years down the road, everybody's going to be fine and happy because I am telling you, we are going to experience explosive growth, mathematical okay. explosive growth. Thank you, Niall. And back to you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Uh, just before I, I, I turn to Clive, uh, Fiona, I just want to put a question to you. It's actually been, um, I was messaged by uh, someone on my Twitter account just before, and they said, they, they said they're a UK music manager. I've achieved nine billion streams. It's not the platforms, it's the NDAs on the deals, ban them. Agree or disagree? I understand why businesses might need to have NDAs, but actually we are a global industry. You know, to me, every digital transaction or whatever you wanna call it can be traced, it's digital. There shouldn't be any opacity, and if, you, if it's your work, why do you not know what's going on with it? It's extraordinary. But to me, yes, it's not necessarily a problem only with the streaming platforms, but the record labels, which have this huge hold on everything because the major record labels also own the major publishers, and the value of the song itself has been suppressed and decimated. Um, and the value of the recording has been raised up. And that's because of that archaic, to do with the physical manufacture, like I was saying before. Mm. So if we could just even out so that the song itself is valued. I mean, you know, I was saying this yesterday. I did a talk at a uni last night. You know, nobody, m most people don't want to walk up the aisle to a beat. They walk up the aisle to a song. It's the lyrics, the melody, the beautiful chords. And that is, it's, it's what brings all the value to the streaming platforms. It brings all the value to these huge companies. You know, when the, when the shares get sold, 
They've grown enormously. Look at all that value. And it's all built on the foundation of these incredible songs. Mm. But the people who made these incredible songs are not being remunerated. No, no Fiona, and yes, really I mean, die this is a, it's a very constant refrain that we're getting. We, we, we do understand that part, but it's just in terms of, of NDAs. And yeah. as someone who, who's, you know, who lectures in this subject, who is obviously, you know, uh, who has perspective wider than, than just artistic perspective as well as an academic perspective, is the problem is is the problem NDAs themselves, or can some NDAs be justified and perhaps they could, should be limited when it comes to stopping artists knowing exactly what their songs are earning them? I think, what are they trying to hide? Why? Why would they be trying? You know, if you're not doing something wrong, why not let it all come out in the open? Mm. I think. I think they probably feel a bit guilty and they know there's something a little bit not right about what's going on. And I think that's why they're a bit afraid to actually open the books. Mm. Okay, thank um, you. You know, I love what Niall said, we are all a family, but it is... <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> thank you. Clive Efford. Thank you, So, after we've um, finished our, our hearings, we'll write a report that will... Uh, make recommendations to Parliament, effectively the government, and the government respond to those recommendations. So we've received in our written evidence um, calls for us to recommend that Parliament should limit the amount of time a corporate partner can recoup their investment against the creative's royalties and limit the time that they can own the copyright, after which it should return to the, um, the, the composer or, or the artist. Uh, so is, is that a recommendation that you would endorse? It's a, it's a question that's open to all three of you. I can see so, so as I was responding. So. In, the affirmative, in the affirmative, yes, copyright should revert back to the creator after yes. a fixed period of time, and you shouldn't be able to recoup costs that you haven't necessarily spent in perpe perpetuity, so I completely support that. The the big the running joke in the music business ever since I've been in it all my life I'm 68 years old was you know the music business is the only business where after you pay off the mortgage or the house they still own the house Does, <laughs> doesn't make any sense it doesn't make it, it there's no other business on earth that does that we pay back all the royalties pay back and they still own our property. It was like that. That uh, it was. It's ridiculous. I mean, and, and uh, this year, when I uh, attempted to buy uh, my rights back, um, you know, it was like you know they offered me all sorts of money to keep my property, and of course, the it's really brilliant why they would do so is because if you are now making deals with streaming companies and believe me these are very smart people they know what's coming down the road if you sell off all the assets then the record company is worthless if you sell off all those songs and all that stuff reverts back to the artist and you go and you buy universal what are you buying you need to buy bob dylan you need to buy all of those things that exist um you know so it's uh it, so, it, it's a mess that can be easily cleaned up and right now is the absolute best time for it to be cleaned up because they know we know that the future like they say it's so bright i have to wear shades i'm wearing shades <laughs> I, can't, I can't see but, but, so so, but, so can i can i ask that you said that that, that you know that, that it would be simple to sort this out very briefly what sort of formula would you put in place for, for, for working out when it should revert back to uh, the ownership of, uh, of, the, of the creative mind that's behind it? Well, see, the, here's where uh, I believe that uh, negotiations should take place. If we're sitting at the table, we'd all figure out um, the, the proper way to do things. We, we come up with a formula. As, as, as I said, this was... This is really simple to me. A great deal is when both partners leave the room happy. So we could sit down. I don't want to say that this is what the number should be and that's what the number should be. But if we were seating at the table 
if we were seated at the table and we're now discussing this, we can easily discuss the wrongs. And, and I think because I know so many of the CEO, I know them all. They're all my friends that we can sit at the table and we can be honest and we can laugh and joke and we can say, Phew. Yeah, now you know you really screwed me on that one. I bet you made a four, you know. I mean, we're 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 adults. We're past that. But now, from this point going forward, we have a very clear eye on what's going to happen in the future. And trust me, people, when I tell you, the future is incredible because, um, um, as I, I'm sorry, uh, it was Fiona who brought it up, I believe. Yeah, you, you know, all of these things that we were subordinate to breakages and returns and things like that, that's all gone out the window. Our contracts and the, all that terminology is still in place. It mean it's meaningless now. Let's let's laugh about it, put it behind us and say, this is what the future looks like. This is what your real expenses are. This is what your real growth looks like. The, let's deal with real numbers. We can only deal with real numbers if they show us real numbers because we're just making it up now. We're guessing at it. In the old days, I, I remember talking to Michael Jackson once and he was trying to figure out a formula where, we, where he could have a pennies deal where he would know what he was making all around the world because the math was so unbalanced and he just didn't quite know where it was and i said you know michael that that makes sense that that's your right that's your property you should know what you're making i'm i'm i guarantee you um all uh, you know i'm thrilled to be on this committee but i'm pretty sure you know what your salary is you know what your worth is you know what you're going to get paid you know that and you can audit um audit has always been our auditing has always been our wonderful uh, mechanism where we can go in and look at the end of the year and say, oh, my God, I really made that much money? I had no idea because we really are kept in the dark and 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 streaming. And it's not the streaming services. Let's let's clear this up. It's not the streaming services that we have the problem with. It's fantastic that they can distribute our product in such an effective, wonderful way and keep a great digital trail. It's the labels that are that are perpetrating this and we need to really address this. And if you have the power to do it, because we don't, if you have the power to do this, we would be eternally grateful. I, Fiona said it so perfectly, what's there to hide? I think what's what's you know what they're hiding is the absolute the humongous difference between what the people who create the music we make it if we didn't make it there would be no record company but when you see the disparity between that, that I mean it's it's just absolutely ridiculous and the thing that they know is that it's going to get even greater and once it reaches those numbers They'll have so much power that we can't fix it. Let's fix it now because we know what's coming. And, and just, just before Fiona comes in, so you'd say that it's, it, it is the, the big three record companies that uh, are the blockage to actually you know, coming to the, the solution that you've set out, Noah? Absolutely. Unequivocal. Yeah, Fiona, so I think you wanted to... Yeah, I wanted to explain why this is a constant refrain, because that was the comment while I was speaking last time. It's a constant refrain because this has been going on for a long time and the situation is worsening all the time because every day tens of thousands of new songs are uploaded to the streaming services. So they've got more and more content and that actually drives the rate down per song. So actually this problem is getting worse every single day. And um, yeah, so... You know, during the pandemic, for example, we've got the whole nation staying at home, listening to more music than ever before. We've got these huge multinationals based outside the UK making these extraordinary profits. You know, 4.4 billion revenue in the first six months of 2020 was the figure added up. Um, and, you know, it's like all the creators are forced to live on universal credit because actually, even though the gigs are cancelled, hit songwriters should be able to live on their streaming income, but they can't. So there is, that's why it's a constant refrain. It's an emergency. The UK government's actually picking up the bill. And I think it's quite, 
it's quite shameful and um you know there's a lot of there's a lot of anger and sadness a lot of depression about this and you know i have great hope for the future as well i think this is an amazing opportunity for the uk to become world leaders in how do you change this how do you fix this data management making things much more fair the splits between the song and the record you know it's a huge wonderful opportunity and there are there are real practical consequences to this. Somebody created a football analogy earlier on. Well, it's as if the Premier League is literally cannibalizing, not even the Premier League, the top four, the big four of uh, cannibalizing all of the other teams. And that means that there's no conduit for new talent. There's no lower league teams for players to develop their skills in. You know, someone like me as an artist, I don't need anyone to pontificate which label, major or minor, I sit in within the ecology. I just need a fair split for the music that I, I create. And I think mm -hmm. there are many artists out there that don't even want to lecture them on whether they're major, minor or in between. It's just creating a system that is more of a level playing field, has more of the transparency um, that you described, Clive, so that I don't need to necessarily be friends with the people I'm coming to the table with to know that even if I'm an outsider to this, sometimes what feels like a bit of a, an industry cabal, that at least there's a base rate of being treated fairly as a creator. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Julie? Hello. Um, Fiona, um, last week we heard from Guy Garvey that he's edited his tracks um, to optimise them for streaming platforms. Um, do you think that's widespread in the industry and has streaming influenced the way you write songs? Yeah, that's definitely very widespread. Streaming's definitely influenced the way songs are written. I mean, technology has always affected, you know, the form has always affected the content. But I do have to say that because of algorithms and algorithmic radio, mm. um, certain types of music are being favoured over others. And it is making people think, well, if I'm going to pay the rent this month, I'm going to have to make music that sounds kind of exactly like that song that was really big. So we get this kind of extraordinary whitewashing of the variety, the cultural diversity, and and it's it's actually homogenizing music in quite an alarming way. The other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, um, I mean, Soweto can probably talk more about this, but, you know, a stream um, is 30 seconds. That's what counts as a stream. If you click before 30 seconds, that doesn't count as a stream. So within 30 seconds, everybody's trying to grab the audience's attention. But, you know, if you're writing a symphony, if you're writing a nine minute long jazz odyssey, that's, you know, your nine minutes still counts the same as a 31 second long song. So there's, there are lots of odd things like that, which are really skewing numbers and really, really hitting income. Do you think there's enough transparency in the way these algorithms, the way the music is selected um, on these platforms? Well, there's no transparency about the algorithms. I mean, human beings make algorithms, which means that algorithms have um you know subconscious unconscious bias you know so there 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 are very odd things about algorithms they're they're deeply flawed because they're made by humans and they favor some things over others so would would transparency around that help do you think or would it not make any difference i think there's a deeper issue there than transparency i think it's I think we're talking about robot ratio, <laughs> which is... Oh, dear. Which is quite, <laughs> we don't want that. So I don't exactly know what to say about that. I mean, Soweto, you're nodding. Maybe you have something to say, or Niall. And is there anyone else? Yes. Hi, Soweto. Hello, Julia. With my hat, both as a jazz musician and as a hip-hop artist, perhaps even more as an MC, if you want to get playlisted, there's a particular sort of format or the catchy hook, or you're writing for a particular aesthetic in a sense. It doesn't reward people who are going to take risks. As Fiona mentions, create longer songs, longer form content. Um, you're writing for a very quick, and if you like, disposable sort of sound. Um, that's going to have lasting effects on the type of content that this country produces. And we should step in and intervene to make sure that there is diversity, to protect mm -hmm. diversity.
Is that any different, just exploring that a second, is that any different than um, in the days where, you know, getting on Radio 1 and getting played on Radio 1, they liked songs that were kind of two and a half to three minutes long. Um, is it any different than that or, or, or is it the same? It is different because in the days before perhaps a clear channel or before the influence of streaming now, labels would invest, as I mentioned Rod Stewart and David Bowie, they invested in these artists in their first three albums, but they weren't successful. You know, you could afford to do bad numbers in your first or second or third quarter. Now, if you don't immediately hit those numbers, if you don't immediately make the playlisting cut, mm -hmm. then you can be dropped and they'll cut all of that investment. Okay, um, and moving on to Niall, um, You've said yourself you've been performing and songwriting for a long time. Um, how has perform your performing and songwriting changed in response to the rise of streaming throughout your career? Well, I, I don't want to... Uh, it's not that I don't want to answer your question. It's because that's just... That's just trends. You know, you, you know you're in whatever the current zeitgeist is... Hopefully, if you're a good, passionate artist, you respond to that. You you do whatever you do. I just want to say that, um, and I really want to leave you with this because this is really why I'm here. Um, artists and writers are not remunerated equally. They do not they do not get their fair share of the pie. And regardless of what songs we're writing and how long they are and that and this and that, that's, that's just the world. That's can, just I, can I just explore that a little bit? Because we heard, we've had evidence around non-featured artists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the headline artist will get remunerated you're saying unfairly, I think I agree with you, but the non-featured artists, do you think the position's even worse for them? Well, absolutely, but but that's, you know, that's a, a question of of deals and what a, a, an artist is willing to do. And there, there'll always be these different types of negotiations. I'm very old school. I used to take an attitude of we're all partners. And, you know, maybe it's because I'm an old hippie. But, you know, to me, if, <laughs> honestly, <we> honestly <laughs> if, there, if there were two or three people in the room and we're writing, we're partners. It's easy. I like easy. I like easy deals. Um, I don't want to fight over, you wrote that word and you wrote this word. I don't. That's not where I'm coming from. What I really want to look at is the bigger issue. And... And I am so honored to be <laughs> talking to this committee because I know I'm not the outsider, but this affects us all. If if the UK is a leader and and says this can be fixed, because it, honestly, I, I hope that you can understand that I am not um, I, I, I'm not some wacky person. I'm not overly angry i'm not I'm, I'm not that guy um i i just want fairness i am a two-time cancer survivor i understand the value of life i understand being fair with your partner being fair to your friends music is a gift you know we're all slaves to this whatever we're complaining about, we're still going to get up tomorrow morning and write songs. <laughs> uh, we can't help it. We cannot help it. Uh, and we want you guys to like it and we do it for you, but we really do it for us. It, it, I, I really need to stress this point one more time and I'm going to get out of here because this is so important. There's never been a better time if we were sitting in the room with the big CEOs and I, and believe me, I'll write the mathematical formula out for them. And I guarantee you, they understand it. And we can see where this business is going and we deal with NDAs and we sit there and we look at the math, the same math that we learned in school. And we see where this business is going. Everybody's going to say, Hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, I, I could live with that. I mean, that's a pretty good number that I am going to get over the next 10, 15, 20 years, or however long they're going to stay in the business. This can now be 
a great paradigm shift for songwriters and artists all over the world. Things would change so much. Um, you know, I, I I love when you brought up the fact that in the old days, David Bowie, uh, I, I brought this up to someone yesterday. I was talking about the group Los Lobos and they were on Warner Brothers and Los Lobos didn't get dropped. They would put out record after record and they would never hit. And then the movie about Richie Valens came out and they did the soundtrack. And then all of a sudden, Los Lobos was the thing. The record company knew it. They knew that they should invest in them. They knew that they should hold on to them because one day they'd pay off. Right now, the situations that we have um, are so crazy and so unfair that if we got situation, if we got into a uh, an economic formula, uh, and first of all, I, I, I'm going to say this one more time. I want to know what the hell a stream is worth, what it really is economically. Just show me the number so I could sit down with my accountants and we can go over real numbers. Because right now, even though I love the way Spotify gives me the stats and all that sort of stuff, I don't know what's on the other side of that wall. I don't have I don't have a clue. So you can tell me I did a, a billion of this or 750 million of that. 70, 750 million of what? Yeah, a billion exactly. of what? You've made your point very clearly. Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Come back to a point that you were talking about a moment ago in terms of um, algorithms. Um, isn't it the difficulty sort of twofold? in terms of algorithms. First of all, you discussed the, the homogenous nature, and I think uh, Soweto has well mentioned this, of music as a result of the algorithms, that effectively we lose that diversity because they're, they, they, they pick up on music which is uh, quite general in form. That's, to a certain extent, that's not a bad thing for a global company in terms of these record companies, because if you, if you boil it right down, they can, they can market it to more people. So that, that sort of, uh, it, it's, it's something that seems quite unpleasant to, to us who like, you know, who like diversity of music. But from a purely business perspective, it probably makes some sense that they have this sort of, these algorithms work in the way that they do. What do you think? I think, I think that's, I think yes, that's counterintuitive. Sorry. Yeah. I think that's actually. Sorry, is that for me? Uh, do you want to go first, yeah. Sweto, and then Fiona? Okay. I think that's actually counterintuitive because if there is this diverse musical ecology, then there'll be the next fad, the new thing that they can then hive off and then celebrate yeah. the next, you know, but if that's not happening, then you just have homogeneity, you just have bland, you just have the things that are risk averse and music requires risk. Certainly the type of music that I'm involved in and the type of music I'm inspired by, the ramifications for that culturally, I don't even want to get into, mm. but in the purely business model terms, it's a terrible idea mm. to, merely restrict the sort of uh, algorithmic sonic wall that, that mm. we have around us. Mm. I would just add to that and say, you know, the UK has some of the most wonderful songwriters and composers in the world, but they're not being allowed to shine on the world stage if, they're, if this homogenization is just absolutely clamping down on all that creativity. Mm. We, you know, we would never get the Beatles nowadays. Mm. They, wouldn't, they wouldn't make their way through that algorithm. And I have to say, yeah, algorithms are like radio. And I would say that does make it sound like a license. Um, but yeah, that's just harking back to no, my I, point. I, yeah. I, I get that. In terms of, um, just to follow up on that though, in terms of radio autoplay effectively, whenever I'm on my Spotify, I listen to the music I want to listen to. And then if I've not changed to something else I want to listen to, it starts playing something else, the, the autoplay function, if you like. Um, are the rates, do we know if the rates are different for if you're played during that autoplay, therefore you're subject to an algorithm, or if someone actively seeks out your music, Fiona? As far as I know, the rates are the same, but I have to say the rates are different for the people listening for free mm. compared to if you're paying premium. The rates are different in every country. So actually my answer to that question is we don't know <laughs> the answer to that question nobody knows because of mm. these ndas which we've talked about yeah also but, the, so the, 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 internet, also the, the the maybe nefarious but certainly opaque relationship with playlisters mm. much like radio pluggers back in the day 
the amount of leverage that they have or connection they have to make sure your record gets heard, algorithms or not, is something that would should have more transparency around it. We should. So there's not like influencers, aren't they? Like like social social media influencers, except on Spotify and Apple Music. Is that, right. Would they, is, that what, is that what the character is? That is that a fair characterization? They get your song the traction that it needs to get heard and get the streaming numbers. But without them, you, you're you're stuck in the mire, and that's not necessarily a, an equitable or sustainable yeah. situation. What do, what do they get out of it? A cut, <laughs> I believe it's called another middleman. Yeah, 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 yeah. A slice of the pie, um, and you know, depending on how much work they do for you, then that differential goes up up or down. But I think that is the problem in, inherent in it. Once they've got too much power to decide what's heard or what's mm. not heard, then all sorts of diverse and interesting music is invisibilized and we need to mm. stop that from happening. Is it more, I'm, I'll, I'll, I will move on to Heather in one second, but is it more, um, is it more sort of worthwhile? Is it more, it seems to be it's the same rate if it's autoplay as opposed to being actively sought. But in some ways that's actually wrong, isn't it? Because if you are an artist and someone goes and actively seeks out your, your song and your music, that connection is deeper, is it not? And therefore should the reward not be greater as a result? Well, Fiona. Well, yeah, someone has just texted me and said it's a different rate for algorithmic plays. Right. OK. But it has been proven that all these huge Spotify numbers don't necessarily translate to deep fan mm. relationships. Um, and it maybe is because of this huge, huge algorithmic placing. I mean, someone said on the last session that 60% of pe people listening to a platform like Spotify end up going into those playlists that just roll and roll and roll. Um, yeah. yeah. So, no, there's not a deep yeah. relationship. But Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Heather Wheeler. You're muted, Heather. You're muted, Heather. Oh, she's gone. It's got the ceiling. You're still muted. Great. Try that. Is that any better? Marvellous. There you are. All, all things come to those who wait. So, um, in the last session, we um, oh, had talked about uh, how streaming disproportionately particularly affects um, jazz and classical music. So, Soweto, um, have you had to actually mitigate this yourself? And I'm trying to work out how on earth you would do that. With, with jazz stuff, um, but also then, if it has had real effects on you, are you having to more um, be more reliant on live performances? Yeah, um, there's so many ways in which the current streaming ecology really damages me as a jazz musician. As I mentioned earlier, it deflates the value of our genre by mm. three to six percent mm. because of, of both this pro rata um, thing and versus a user-based way of, of paying subscribers paying and because of the algorithms um, I think also the way in which I make an album as an independent jazz musician as well um, it's, it's quite a, a hefty investment uh, mm. for my last album it was a big band album it takes a lot of compositional uh, chops and and time in the rec recording booth as well as all the PR and all the stuff that you self-finance um, sort of economics uh, less and less make less and less sense when you're only going to get a slither of that back on your royalties or your streaming royalties. There's less of a, an incentive, if you like, to create that bigger body of work or that more taxing sort sort of music. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does. Um, but the live performances, I mean, right. obviously we've got the problem with COVID, mm. but um, okay. did you see that this was ramping up and so you were going to have to, or not exactly... Um, write off the Spotify money, but, you know, know that that doesn't even buy the Christmas presents, you know? It's been a journey. Well, probably pays the past... TV licence. Marvellous. <laughs> it's been a journey, as I maybe intimated earlier, over the past 15 years of expecting a small but not negligible sum from record labels, royalties, mm. PRS, realising that wasn't happening, given mm. uh, the situation Kwame described earlier, piracy in that situation in the mid-noughties. So like, okay, live music is where we'll do it. We'll make all of our money from record sales on the road. The label suddenly stepped in and decided they wanted 360 deals and to have a finger in, in that pie. And since then, we've yeah, we've 
sort of been battling it out in, in that ground. 2020 being a year of not touring at all and not selling any merchandise suddenly reveals to you the shocking iniquity of the current streaming setup. As I mentioned, 4.2 billion pounds paid out to the top three labels this year in a situation where eight, in, eight out of 10 of us aren't getting 200 quid a year. Mm -hmm. That can't be right. That can't, and it says, I think also 600 million pounds in bonuses were paid out to the top five label executives. There's clearly enough money sloshing about in, in the pie and what could be done with that? How would it be funding new musicians coming through? How would it be funding singer songwriters, composers, musicians, arrangers to do their next Magnus Opus? Because if not, it's just demoralizing and it keeps Britain's cultural, certainly climate uh, uh, stunted, you know, Needs, needs brilliant to... thanks i mean there aren't that many brilliant things that have come out of covid but um i think we've managed to find another one that's great thank you very much Welcome. thank you heather alex davis jones thank you chair and thank you to all the witnesses for joining us this afternoon it's been an incredibly insightful session and really really worthwhile so thank you all for your contributions uh, we've talked a lot about spotify and the streaming services the sort of mainstream streaming streaming services but do you think that the user-centric platforms like Deezer or even the artist-owned platforms like Tidal are a fairer model than Spotify? I'm not sure who wants to come in there. It's open to all of you. Well, I personally think user-centric would help niche music. It would help local music. It would help independent artists. I think they would still need to make sure there was more transparency. I think they would perhaps have to get away from that market share thing whereby the biggest label gets the biggest chunk of the money because that's why when you listen to your favorite Aberdeenshire singer-songwriter the money actually goes to Beyonce much as yeah. I love Beyonce but um so I think as long as there were certain things put in place user-centric could be a beautiful um scenario and could help a lot yeah so what did you think you as a jazz musician that that those platforms would benefit you more given the difficulties you've expressed with your genre hugely I'm the sort of musician both as a jazz musician and I guess what's called alternative hip hop artist. There is a tremendous like loyal fan base that loves my stuff out there and will support it, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the streaming streaming revenue. So I'm not looking to compete with a Drake or Madonna or anything as much as I love those artists. Just, it ain't gonna happen. It's a bit late for me. But I have got a loyal but passionately, you know, you know how jazz musicians and jazz fans can be. Um, particularly loyal and, uh, and attached to a particular aesthetic mm -hmm. and that deserves its own model of remuneration I, th I think yeah, definitely and then um coming to social media so we've all heard about how youtube and tiktok have blown up and really changed music and how people are accessing new music um what do you think the impact of, of social media companies has been on your music maybe niall if i ask you well i i think it's been um positive as far as the consumer is concerned, right? The consumers now are having um, probably the time of their lives. I mean, if I were a young person right now coming up, I now have access to more music than I've ever had before. Um, but there's something else I wrote down before I went to bed last yeah. night because I knew my brain cycles would be not uh, exactly on point this morning. Um, another great concept. Why not move to a broadcast rate of payment um, to musicians for passive listening? This is, I think, uh, uh, what Ms. Wheeler brought up a few minutes ago, because <clears throat> we were talking about... Um, anyway, so the broadcast rate... Now, please listen to this. The broadcast rate is appropriate for compensating artists and songwriters for music that has been streamed to consumers without them searching for it, right? Not the lower sale rate. Also, streaming services should be more transparent with, with data about when users have actually searched for a song versus when they've, have, when they've listened to it passively via an algorithm or a playlist. Yeah. I mean, that... that yeah, I, I I'm acting like I can call on people. Yes. Uh, yeah, if you're not feeling, yeah, coming in, yeah. But I mean, it, the, these are simple things, really simple things that we can do that would change things substantially. It would make a huge difference. 
And it's easy to do this. Yeah. I just wanted to add that, you know, even if we went to another model like user-centric, you know, at the moment, to me, the deepest problem is the fact that the labels and, and publishers don't have an even split of the revenue, which is making the song so undervalued, which is just decimating the grassroots of every avenue into music, really. So until that is kind of evened up, as much as possible. So instead of 15, 55, you know, more like 35, 35 in an ideal world. And the record labels will say, well, we have huge overheads still in developing artists. And what I would say to that as a songwriter is that songwriters spend a lot of their own time and energy and money unpaid because we don't get paid to go to work. We get paid solely on royalties. Mm. So we're actually taking the risk and we're actually developing the artists for free for the record labels. We're taking the risk um, and we're not getting paid for it. So, yeah, it's a constant refrain. <laughs> yeah. But I just wanted to say that again about if that record label publisher split was more even, then that would really help with a lot of these problems. Yeah. We have yeah. fantastic revenue collection organisations, as I mentioned earlier, PPL, PRS. If the split was more equitable rather than it is at the moment, 80-20, towards the labels and the song, then it's really cutting out the entire ecology as mentioned of songwriters, composers, arrangers that could live comfortably off of a 50% as opposed to 20%, you know? So it's, it's just tweaking a system that we actually have and that was created to protect these creatives in the first place. Exactly correct. Yeah, I agree. Um, what, what, I'd like to explore a bit more on the social media um, impact that that has had on your music. We, we, we hear a lot about the social media companies and one of the arguments that they'll throw us is that, um, oh, they're giving the artists and the songwriters exposure. So that outweighs sort of the effects of the safe harbour on copyright. Is that something you'd agree with? Do, do, do you recognise that exposure outweighing, outweighing the, the rights? Super brief, but I've definitely been on the bad end, if you like, of new platforms like Instagram, um, basically invisibilizing posts because they don't meet their algorithms or they don't pass, they're a bit too polemical or yeah. not the kind of music they like, particularly political songs or mm. things like talking about COVID. And that's really worrying. I had a long chat with Loki, another rapper who does things and talks about subjects like this, and he won't be able to do it. The freedom that he had on a YouTube 10 years ago has gone now. And it's if you want to have promoted content uh, you have to be in there. It seems to have a, a tiny cabal of people that get to um, mm. let your stuff go, go through the scene. Sorry, yeah. Fiona. No, Fiona. Well, yeah, I wanted to say um, we can't pay the rent with exposure. Yeah. You know, for an artist who's on a big label and they get huge exposure, it's wonderful. They get branding deals with huge companies um, and, you know, and they go on huge tours and sell merchandise. And, and everybody who's further down the chain, like the songwriters, are not actually getting any income from that exposure. They're not getting any income from the branding. They're not getting any income from merchandise. Um, we only get 4% of live. Um, so, so no, it's not good enough. And, you know, I know TikTok's recently been in the news a lot for, and hopefully that's being sorted out. You, you know, music has been utterly devalued. Why is it being used for free? I recently had a tech company trying to use one of my songs on an advert for free and it's like actually for a song to be on an advert is one of the few revenue streams that's actually still there and that has also gone down and down and down because because it's the only revenue stream and they know that they can all undercut each other so we're in quite desperate times and it's quite serious and yeah it's kind of it's an emergency yeah yeah thank you all thank you chair no more questions from me thank you john nicholson Um, thank you very much, Chair. I think we've had some incredibly memorable uh, lines throughout the course of um, of this of this hearing. Uh, I was particularly struck, Fiona, when you said that eight out of ten songwriters earn less than two hundred pounds a year. Extraordinary. Uh, and Soweto, I'm a great fan of jazz, and I I still listen to seventy eight records on jazz as well as 33s and, and Spotify as well, but there's nothing like 78 records yeah. for that fabulous old jazz sounds. My great grand uncle was a jazz musician 
in the 1930s in New York, and I've inherited all of his jazz collection in 78, and I play it in a fabulous old 78 player. So um, I was interested that you said that you really relied on tours and on merchandising. I imagine you've been hard hit this year because of COVID. Absolutely. I've, I've been as resourceful as I can. I did an online festival, which involved going to different locations, filming them and, and doing all that sort of stuff. But the same sort of love of collecting and you describing it and putting a 78 on and the sign of crackle, that's what, you know, keeps that attachment of jazz audiences there and they'll come to a show and, and want a signing and want some physical, you know, um, reminder of the fact that they were at a show at a particular time. Another thing that we haven't discussed is how maybe it's not user-centric, but artist-centric models of, of hosting your music on these streaming platforms could be there so that I could offer something that's more bespoke to a listener, if not a signed stream, uh, some higher level broadcast quality WAV file, um, some other level of interaction. And there's no ability to, to, to set your own prices as, as an artist on okay. streaming platforms. Uh, you get told that's what Given how important touring is for you, what effect is Brexit going to have on you? Uh, it's the ins it's, uh, the insecurity around it um, that's always been the problem and promoters not quite knowing if they can go ahead and, and book tours and so forth. So the insecurity around it is the biggest thing. Um, tariffs don't necessarily affect us um, to the same degree, but there will be an implication when there is physical merchandise on sale at these places. So it's affected us already in lots of cultural ways, but I think there's an opportunity to to still do good good work after Brexit. It's it's really when there's clarity that that'll be the case. I, I see you nodding away to to that. And if, if you know, not to say. Yeah, I wanted to say something else about Brexit, which hasn't really been covered so far. Which is, you know, if we were still going to be part of the EU, we would, as songwriters and music creators, we would be protected by the EU copyright directive, which would which would protect our IP and actually leaving the EU and the UK, the last government deciding to not uphold that in UK law is a terrifying prospect for, for music creators. But it's why? also an opportunity for the Tell UK. Why. Because we're going to be worse off than our EU colleagues that we write with. You know, we're going to be, we're going to be absolutely unprotected by those laws. Those, you know, the safe harbour, everything has been addressed with the EU copyright directive pretty good, pretty good legislation. And we're actually outside of that now. We're completely, we need more protection. Our IP needs protection. And I think the UK actually has an opportunity to kind of beat the European legislation. Why not make it even better? If we're free from those constrictions, it's a chance to protect creators even more. You know, music's one of the biggest exports of the UK. It's one of the things we're most famous for in the world and most proud of, the diversity of it, the extraordinary things that come out of the UK. And we don't want to see that devastated. We want to see that cultural richness and diversity, not just the bank of mum and dad allowing people to make it through and make music. You know, we need to really protect our creators. And it's a chance to do that. It's amazing. So we do. Yeah, just to tie in from that, you know, that's money that's being drained away into supranational, opaque multinationals um, and not your constituents. It's being driven away from people in this country who pay their taxes and, and stimulate more musical and cultural growth. And so even, not to sound a jingoistic note, post-Brexit, it kind of makes no sense to have this leverage now to be able to create our own laws and to be siphoning off money to supranational companies abroad. You know. OK, back to you, Chair. Directly. Thank you, John. Um, Niles, just, just, just finally, um, we've, we've heard a lot during the evidence sessions about contracts between artists and record companies, uh, effectively how they're sort of one-size-fits-all at the start of a career, such as, you know, we've talked about breakages, NDAs, etc., etc. How big do you have to get in order to not be subject to that, to be able to effectively put your own terms across to get a better deal? You're always going to be subject to that. Um, the bigger you get, the more leverage you have. But um, 
I, I think uh, Fiona hit on it earlier and I uh, reiterated. It's all about transparency. If, if we can get rid of the NDAs or at, at least uh, we, we absolutely need to have a place at the table to see what's going on with these deals, to see what we create what that's worth, what that's, what that's actually generating. And once we know what those numbers are, um, I believe that we can all sit down at the table and come up with formulas that are beneficial to all parties. I think that we've lived in a world, um, of course, it felt better for us, you know, a long time ago when we were younger and it, felt a hell of a lot better for us uh, bef before COVID. But now that we've had a chance to sit down and look at our lives and see the impact COVID, COVID has had upon us, um, we then go back to the thing that we thought we could really depend on, our royalties, the things that we've done before that people still love and listen to, sometimes more than the stuff that we're creating now. Um, it's, we, we I, you know, I, I stress this and I can't stress this enough. We have a great opportunity right now is the time because when we sit down with pencil and paper and we can actually draw a timeline into the future, we could look at the growth. We could look at this growth curve that we're on and it's clear. It's not magic. We can look at this, this growth curve that we're on and we can say, if we just stay on that, mm. we can pretty much figure out what the big companies are going to earn. If we just stay on that curve, we can say to them, you know, you could chop off this bit and give it to the people who keep you alive and you're still going to do fantastic. You're going you're gonna to see numbers that are just absolutely off the chart. But, but Niles, if I may, yeah. um, just, just to clarify, though, that there is a route where artists can get a better deal. It's basically just being hyper-successful, if you like, a sort of Ed Sheeran type of, of situation. But is it fair to say that that route is narrower than it used to be? I don't, I don't know whether it's narrower or not. I can't really tell. Look, I've been in that position where, you know, I've gotten, you know, big, big, big records and I get these massive checks that come from nowhere and you go, wow, where did that come from? I, I understand that. Um, but that's not real life. The real record business, the real music business is this wonderful mosaic of all types of music. And in the old days, just to explain it to you, in the old days, they used to say the people, you know, when I would have my good runs, they would say, oh, you're paying the rent on this building. And these were all just sort of little joke phrases, but they actually had meaning that the top, the people who were performing at the top were actually carrying the people at the bottom because we all were one big family. You didn't drop those people because they didn't do well. Someone mentioned, you know, David Bowie's and the Beatles. You, you didn't drop them because you knew at some point in time they'd pay off. So, so right now we have a situation that is so financially viable and so, um, uh, how can I say it, that the future is so clear because uh, all of those things that used to be a hindrance in the past have gone away. It's just gone away and, and they're not coming back. So now we can say, hmm, here we go. We're family. Let's sit down. Let, let's, let's be fair. Uh, you know, everybody is not going to be Ed Sheeran. Everybody's not going to be Dua. Every, you know, that's, that's just the reality. And we all know that. And even Dua won't be Dua soon. When I first got in the business, someone told me, they said, you know what, Now here's what you got to do. You need to learn to embrace failure because as great as you're doing right now, and it's true, when I started out, every record I put out was a hit. I did not have one flop. But when that day came and I had a flop, I had nothing but flops until I met David Bowie. I was just flop after flop after flop. But the one thing I learned was if you learned how to deal with that type of uh, roller coaster that we're inevitably going to be on for the rest of our lives, 
um, it, it's okay. We love being in this business. And if we have a fair and equitable uh, business, we can get through the hard times as well as enjoying the the great times. And it's always going to be up and down. You know, it's so as I said, we have never had a better time to 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 deal with this issue because now you can sit down and look at somebody and, and let's just say that all they're focused on, and, and I don't want to believe this, but let's say all they're focused on is the money. Right now you can sit down and say, hello, this is what you're going to make uh, in the next 10 years, the next 15 years. Isn't that fantastic? Why don't you just shave off a little of this and do it in a way that protects us, that we can we can see um, what the what the numbers are, and it opens up a system that for the future will be better in the long run for everybody. The more we know, the more we know, the easier it'll be for us to work. Imagine the creators if they knew the cost benefit ratio of what you're putting into a project and you can sit there and go, God, I'm making this big band jazz record, but if I don't know what I'm getting paid for streaming, so this record could be a massive hit. And guess what? I just lost money because I don't even know what anything is worth. I'm sorry. I'm, no, no, that's fine. No, no. As, uh, Kevin Brennan's actually just messaged me to say um, you're very much on message because uh, your, one of your biggest hits was uh, We Are Family by Sister Sledge, I believe. So, yes, it was. <laughs> so, but thank you. And thank, thank you, Niles, for your evidence today. Thank you, Soweto. And thank you, Fiona. It's been really excellent. Thank you. Order. Thank you so order. much for having us. Thank you.